Okay, in this video I want to go over some of the questions uh, or confusion that you have listed in the weekly sticky note feedback for the past four weeks. Um, I'll go through several that I've uh, noticed and uh, try to give you a little insight on those to help you study. Okay, so the first one, um, the question is essentially why uh, is the time derivative of some arbitrary vector v with respect to the inertial frame equal to the time derivative of that same vector v as viewed from a rotating frame plus omega v angular velocity of the rotating frame in the inertial frame crossed with that vector v. Why is this true? Um, I'll try to give a little pictorial view of um, why that sort of holds. So I want to think about an inertial frame and we'll call this, I'll label it x hat and y hat. We're just going to look at a planar frame. So this is the inertial frame. And in this inertial frame, there is a rotating reference frame that we'll use the i hat and j hat. I hat and j hat. Rotating inertial frame. All right. So now I want to draw a single vector, um, and I'll call it V, that is aligned with the I unit vector. So this is our vector V, some arbitrary vector. But it's always going to be aligned with that unit vector. And the... Um, this frame and this vector are rotating with an angular rate r with respect to the inertial frame. Right. r angular rate about the k hat or z hat axis. Okay. So r k hat is the angular velocity. And this vector v can only change in magnitude. As time progresses. Right. So it's rotating at some ang arbitrary angular rate r in the inertial reference frame, uh, but um, its length can uh, decrease or grow as time progresses. Right. So um, if I'm an observer standing on the rotating frame ij and I'm watching that v I'll just see it increase in length along the i hat vector so what that would mean is that the time derivative of v with respect to t with respect to the rotating frame which we call it i hat j hat k hat it's going to be fairly simple. If we define V as some scalar, I'll call it V times I hat, then this time derivative, if I'm standing in there, all I'm going to see is then a simple scalar time change in that scalar V, and it's always going to be in the I hat direction. 
and we can write that as v dot i hat for a little simpler notation. All right, so that scalar can change with time, and uh, but it's always going to be directed in the same uh, direction as i hat. So this is the uh, relative velocity component of the above equation. And then we claim that um, omega of the i, j, k hat in the inertial frame crossed with v is this other component. Now, what does that look like? Well, we know that omega is r times k hat. And then we're going to cross it with v hat, which v is always in the i hat direction. That vector v. So if we cross those two, r, which is pointing into the screen, into the page, crossed with i is going to give us uh, v times r in the j hat direction. So what does that look like? Graphically, if I have this vector v at its current time, um, it has a length of v. And the um, it's always in this i hat direction. So we have j hat, i hat. And it's rotating with this angular velocity r. Well, if I have a, something that's rotating, angular velocity r, I can imagine that the tip of that vector is going to change some amount in a small delta t time. And the vector will now be over here, pointing this way, with some small change. The magnitude here, then, is that r times v, r times v. And you notice it's in the j hat direction. So this is the um, change in v as viewed from the inertial frame at that instant. And we need to add that component to it. Right? So this means that we could write d v in the inertial frame, that's the x, y, z, is then that v dot and the i hat, and then it's going to be plus v r j hat. And if we were to draw that, it's got an i hat and a j hat component. Um, this is the, well, that's all I want to say. Right. And, I, and if you didn't use this intermediate frame, these i and j hats would have to be expressed in terms of the x hat and the y hat. And we need to know the angle between the two frames, which is the integral of the rate with respect to time. Maybe this helps give a little bit of um, explanation of why that equation there is true. All right, so that's the first one I wanted to elaborate a little bit on. The uh, second one is I got to open up the is uh, I know every uh, some people have trouble with problem 4.3 and it was um, badly worded in the book we talked about this in the office hours 
with some of the students. I uh, just wanted to note that you should make that say um, the, the first or second sentence, I forget which one it is, it should say, it is stated in the text that if the maximum and f y over f z equals mu y instead of cornering efficient is 0 0.8 dot 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 so the book says cornering coefficient which is cornering coefficient is c alpha right and that's not what we're looking for here and the figure that is talking about with the dry contract concrete has an alpha and a fy over fz equals mu y and there's a 0 0.8 up here somewhere this thing goes up linearly hits its maximum around 0.8 and this is dry concrete so this corresponds to a slip angle but uh, if mu y equals 0 0.8 then we have fy over fc whatever free body diagram you work out this has to hold that um, fy is 0.8 fc Right. So it's confusing that in the book it's used the word cornering coefficient. Why these things disappear. So that's the second one. Um, all right, another thing is uh, some confusion on homework two about getting the characteristic equation. Right. Specifically, if we have m x double dot plus b x dot, and I'm going to use a bar here to represent the x's as vectors, plus k x bar equals zero, we have this matrix equation. All right. So if x bar is an n by one vector then m b and k are n by n matrices so the characteristic equation is going to be a function of all of the entries of m b and k For example, if um, n equals 2, then m would look like m11, m12, m21, m22, and similarly for b. call um, x is x1 x2 so that's a very common situation that you have the uh, if you look in the book um, and I showed this in class to get the characteristic equation we have to figure this out the de determinant of m s squared plus b s plus k must equal to zero All right well this
this is a big matrix equation. S is a scalar. Right. And in our case, it will be um, 2 by 2, but in general, it's also n by n. If we have uh, the determinant of this thing, then, if we have all the entries there, you can write it as m11 s squared plus b11 s plus k11. There's going to be four entries here that are very similar. m21 s squared plus b21s plus k21 m12 s squared plus b 12 s plus k12 m22 s squared plus b22 s plus k22 the determinant of that it has to be equal to zero well if we have a two by two matrix the determinant is fairly easeable easy we multiply the diagonals and subtract the other diagonals so this would be m 11s squared plus b11s plus k11 times m22s squared plus b22s plus k22 minus the multiplication of the off, other off diagonals and uh, m12s squared plus b12s k12 times m21 s squared b21 s k21 all that equal to zero all right so there this is a characteristic equation the next step is to multiply this out and get it into this common form that then becomes useful um, that is needed to use Ruth's stability criteria so if you do these multiplications out, you get m11 times m22 s to the fourth, right, plus m11 b22 s to the third, plus m11 k22 s squared, plus b11 m22 s cubed plus b11 b22 s squared plus b11 k22 s for example and then We'll get the last term plus k11 m22 s squared plus k11 b22 s plus k11 k22 minus and you got to multiply out that other piece and notice that we the highest order we have. And the polynomial there is 4. Okay. So we had two coordinates x1 and x2 inside of x bar. And um, and then we, and that gave us a 2 by 2. M, B, and K. And that's going to leave us with um, fourth order. Right? And it's going to be in general um, two to the N. 
where that 4 comes from, fourth order polynomial. So that's how you get the characteristic equation. Um, typically, if you have some numbers in these MBK matrices, it can reduce. If some of those entries are zeros or some of those entries are the same, uh, the equation could be simplified too. So that was um, that. Now let's look at the next situation. The next question was, what is a root locus? We haven't really discussed that in class uh, too explicitly. We did a little bit when we talked about the motorcycle video. What is a root locus? So we're going to think about the imaginary real plane. And then we're going to think about an imaginary number. A, and I'll just do A, let's do A plus or minus B. And we'll use uh, J hat as the, uh, or sorry, J, or J equals the square root of negative 1. So that's our imaginary number. We know that we can plot these two roots um, at real value of A and a plus or minus imaginary value of B. So that's pretty straightforward. We put we have two roots here to that polynomial, for example, the one that we just did. We'll find this imaginary number, we can plot that. Well, for a root locus, you can um, note that A and B can be functions of system parameters. We've talked specifically about um, how does this vary with you, for example. So we could say that S, in the second scenario, is some function F of U plus or minus some function G of U in the imaginary portion. All right. Well, let's pick some functions. What if f equals um, 2u and g equals um, the u squared. Maybe that happens to be what the functions are. Now we know that if I vary u, right, so if we vary u from 0 to 10, for example, how will this imaginary value change? Draw another real axis here. real and imaginary axis. So note that um, f is going to go from, its range is from 0 to 20. And g is going to be from 0 to 100. So we'll plot, um, we'll give some maxes here. Um, f is the real component, so it's going to go All the way out to 20, we'll add 10, 5, 15, and g is going to go to 100. So call this 100, um, 50, 25, 75, and then the same 100, 50, 25. 75. And those are all negative. 
So if we start at u equals 0, then f and g are both 0. All right, so we have a starting point here. That corresponds to u equals 0. Then if we uh, check another one, maybe u equals 1. So then f will be 2 and g will be 1. So that's going to I'll zoom in for this. 1 is somewhere around here. Or 2 is somewhere around here. I suppose right here. Call that 2. And then the other one's 1. It's going to be very tiny. So we got two poles here. That corresponds to u equals 1. Well, if u equals 2, then we got uh, 4, somewhere out here, and 8. So I can draw that approximately right here and here. That's u equal, I'm oh, sorry, 2. And then we can go continue on. Let's do uh, u equals 5. So we'll get 10. We're going to be out here on this point. And then uh, 5 squared is 25. So we're there. And there. And then if we do um, u equals 20, I mean u equals 10, then we're going to be on the 20 line for the real and 100. Right. So this curve, as u increases, this was u equals 5, this was u equals 10, we can see that it creates some kind of curve here. through these points. As u increases, so this is with um, increasing u. So this is called a root locus, right? You take a single parameter, vary a single parameter, plot complex root locations, as that parameter varies, and then you're going to get some shape. And you can see that if we um, if we did u equals negative, we're going to start to um, get negative real parts. And you can sort of see how you may control a few things. And if you recall that the real part controls whether it will diverge or converge, and the imaginary part controls the frequency of oscillation. And we can see that um, frequency oscillation and damping, in fact, but we can sort of then observe how varying a single parameter is going to change the dynamics associated with those roots. All right, so that's the root locus and um, should be able to plug in different values if you get the right root in the form of the parameters you're interested in, and then uh, you're good to go. Okay, one more. Um, this was a question: Is uh, what's up with these um, Lagrange equations and the uh, generalized force? There's two aspects to that. One, uh, one of the feedback was that uh, you know we 
know that F equals MA. We believe that. But I wrote that some generalized force equals um, M L I think is that we wrote M L theta dot. It doesn't look right. Um, yeah, that's right. So here this would probably have units of force. Newtons is what it implies, but this doesn't look like Newtons, right? This is theta double dot times m is Newtons times L. Well, this is this is a torque. Newton times some meter if L is a length. So this doesn't sort of match up. Um, we want to keep in mind that if I write the Lagrange equation, there's going to be sort of two forms associated with forces and torques. So I can write T star. If the parameter is an angle, theta, In this equation, um, results in a torque balance, torque or moment balance. And the units here, um, for example, units of Newton meter we use the SI system. But if the generalized equation has to do with a linear variable, x for example, then this is a force balance. Just Newtons. So we call these things both generalized force, but in fact, uh, the one on the top is a torque, right? And the one on the bottom is a force. But for some reason, the nomenclature is generalized force. We don't say generalized torque. Um, so the generalized force is uh, whatever is associated with that particular variable of interest, theta or x. Theta is a rotation, x is a linear distance, so we would get a torque and a force type equation, respectively. So how do we think about this um, generating what those forces, generalized forces are. They're a little confusing. So let's think about a linear one. If I have a force applied to a point, and then that point moves through some distance x, As that force is applied and it's a non-conservative force like a spring is conservative it push back then the work there is um, F times X and this is positive work right you apply the force in the same direction as the motion F times X equals work and um, positive. If the point were to move in that same direction, but the force was in the opposite direction, then we have a negative work. 
negative fx equals the work. Yeah. So that's pretty clear. Our generalized force here, in this case, is just going to be f, and the generalized force here is going to be negative f. We also saw this case where we had an angular variable. So I've got something that's traveled through an angle, theta, from its original position. Um, let's say then a torque was applied while that motion is happening, a non-conservative torque then we'd have a similar situation. Torque times theta equals the work done. And in that case, it's positive. And then if we had the same motion through theta, but the torque was in the opposite direction, torque times theta, negative torque times theta, theta equals work. And we have negative work. Right, the force opposes the motion or helps it is the, is the difference there. In this case, again, um, sort of the simple case, the generalized force equals torque. And over here, the generalized force equals negative torque. Now, we also saw this case that we're still thinking about the variable theta and it rotates some angle theta but there's a force applied here in this case um, let's do it in this direction force through angle theta and let's say the distance between that pivot point and the force is L well there's an equivalent torque, F times L, that represents uh, how this force being applied to this bar um, could generate work. So in this case, it's F times L, which is a torque, times theta equals the work. And that's going to be positive. And then we have the same angular motion, but the force is in the opposite direction, resisting that motion, then we'll get negative FL theta equals work. And so then we see that a little more interesting case, um, that generalized tor uh, force, which is actually a torque, equals FL. And in this case, the generalized force equals negative FL. And so there's some explanation on the generalized forces in the Lagrange equation. And I think there might be one more thing you asked for. Um, solving for work, we got that root locus, y generalized force equals that. The last thing is a little bigger. Um, you know, the body fixed coordinates, we didn't spend a long time on this. I can say a few things about that. For a given rigid body, and I'll draw it as a rigid body potato, my favorite thing, if I attach an I hat and a J hat to it, right, these are the body fixed coordinates, I hat, J hat, and it's moving in some uh, I had x hat in some inertial frame. And then we define these very specific that uh, the velocity of this thing always has a component in the i hat direction u, component in the j hat direction v, and an angular rate about the z, positive z, of r, then um, you can write out the standard equations of motion for this 
for this planar system. And these are laid out in the book. Um, you may have some different forces that right, are acting on this rigid body. F1, F2, um, you may have a torque on these things, torque 1, torque 2, right? It could be all kinds of different forces and torques that are acting on this rigid body. I forgot to say this is sort of lined up with the center of mass here. The general equations of motion that we get are that um, the sum of all the forces acting on that body, and this is a vector, right? And they're going to be the sum of all the forces in the i, j, and k hat directions. So we could call it um, um, the total force they use in the book are x, y, z. That's the sum of all these forces, F1, F2, F3, anything else. Sum of all those forces equals the mass of that object. And then we have to add in these body fixed accelerations properly. And in our case, um, for this planar motion, it simplifies. We don't have any um, Q or P angular rates. We only have R. So that's nice. And we don't have any uh, w dot which is in the z direction so this is going to simplify to u dot oh, i'm sorry minus r v v dot plus r u and then there's no p q and w so this one is zero right there's no motion in the z so you have to come up with the sum of all the forces in the x, summing all the forces in the, um, not in the x, but in the i hat, right, to be body forks, and the sum of all the forces in the j hat equal m times u dot minus rv v dot plus ru. So that's the planar equations of motion for linear motion. Similarly, we can look at the resulting equations of motion for um, the more complex case of uh, if you have, we might have um, a moment of inertia about the z, but we also might have products of inertia with respect to the x and the y axes, right? So if we want to get these equations, uh, the Euler equation, so this is uh, Newton's second law. And then we also have Euler's equation, which is the rotational equivalent of um, Newton's second law, or Euler's equations. Right? So, uh, where do we want to go? We got, um, there's essentially the sum of all the torques, and we don't have any torques about I and J, only about Z um, equals this N value. That's the sum of all torques. And that's going to equal, we're just going to get a scalar equation, but it's um, a bit complex. We won't have any P dots, we don't have any Q dots, but we're going to have all the terms with R dots, and we're going to have all the terms with IZZ, IXY, and IYX. All right. So this is going to equal um, IZZ R dot, that's that first component, plus um, no P component, and no Q component. P squared, P squared, I 
six speed map. I'm confusing myself. P times P and P times Q. I guess it does that just go away? I think it just goes away. We don't. If we only have um, rotation about the z-axis, so your job is to identify the terms that you can get rid of, simplify these things, these matrix equations for Euler's equation and Newton's second law. But then you've got to determine what the sum of the forces are and the sum of the torques acting on that single rigid body. And once you do that, you can just plug those in, and they need to be in terms of um, the U and the V, and the coordinates and the R, um, and they also need to be in terms of the body fixed directions. I feel like I'm screwing up something on the Euler's equations, but yeah, I think that just simplifies if we only have... Uh, rotation about one one planar axis the uh, products of inertia terms aren't going to affect anything and we're going to see that a lot um, if we add in a second degree of freedom um, then you, you may have to have some more terms in the other equations so I'll leave it at that. We can talk more about that. Let's close. We're going to close this off. I think that covers, to some degree, all a lot of the uh, common questions that I saw in the feedback.